Thanks, everybody. Excuse me. Hey, everybody. Uh, like I said, oh, let's see. There we go. My name is Patrick Kettner. I come out from Seattle. I work out in uh, Microsoft on Edge. So if you have any complaints about Edge, feel free to talk to me about it. If you have any complaints about IE, keep them to yourself because it's dead, uh, thankfully. Um, but I'm not really here to talk about what I do at Edge. I'm happy to chat outside of this. But what I'm here today to talk to you on stage is about JavaScript. So, actually, kind of more of a lack of JavaScript. Um, and to be clear, I'm not like hating on JavaScript or anything like that. I, I love JavaScript. It was my first programming language. I learned it at a really, really young age, like a really young age, back when websites were like this. I lived in a great area with a great school, so I was able to kind of get in on the ground floor for the web. Like we got the internet right around the time that Netscape 1 started shipping. So it was really, really cool. And it was kind of a privilege to be able to be on the web at such an early age, because you kind of get to see it like evolve over time. You know, we saw it go from static sites to like DHTML and the Ajaxification of the web. And then we kind of saw the browser wars happen where everybody was adding proprietary features, which sucked. And then we kind of came back in to get into standards. And we saw like the wired redesign, where all of a sudden it was, you could create a, at the time, beautiful website with, you know, CSS standards and everything. And it was awesome. And, you know, it just made you rethink each one of these stages, kind of how we build websites. And then, you know, eventually the, the iPhone came out and we started rethinking again with responsive design. And we could see, you know, the website didn't have to be a static 960 pixels. It could be, you know, a responsive website that looked actually good on mobile. And yet again, we're starting to think about what we can do on new platforms with stuff like progressive web apps. And I'm super excited about progressive web apps. I think most browser folks are. Um, in case you don't know, it's kind of like making, um, We've been adding a bunch of different features to the web platform uh, at various browsers that give you kind of native-like experiences. And it really starts to feel like we can have native-feeling apps completely written, written with web technologies that work cross-device and cross-browser. It's, it's really exciting. And you know, when I've been researching and looking at all these different things, that's one of the things I do at Microsoft is a lot of interop work to find out whether or not code that works in Firefox works in the same in Chrome, works the same in Edge, et cetera. And then we try and fix it. And uh, therefore, because I spend so much time working with weird cutting edge things like what Leia is able to write, we spend a lot of time in stuff like CodePen. And I absolutely love CodePen. It completely changed my life back when it was launched, even though it wasn't really a super original concept when it was launched. Like we've had scratch pads on the web for a really long time, right? Like JS Fiddle has been around since I can remember. But the one thing that really differentiated it, at least for me, was this thing up there. Uh, it's, it's SCSS, the fact that we could have preprocessors on the web. And that was really a big deal. I mean, SAS completely changed the way that I wrote web technology, and pretty much everybody I know that's a developer does as well. And it was really cool. I mean, it's been almost 10 years since SAS was originally released, and it completely revolutionized the way that we did stuff. You know, it introduced variables, CSS modules, all these different things. It was great. It's one of the reasons why it's so wonderful to have on CodePen. But the thing that really sucks about it <coughs> is that SAS is powered by Ruby. See, as somebody who travels a lot and works on CodePen a lot, a lot of times they'll be working on a demo or trying to debug somebody else's demo, and they've happened to use uh, SAS or another preprocessor on their page. And as soon as that airplane starts hitting the sky, I don't have the ability to change anything anymore. And it really bugs me a lot. Like, it, it's frustrating that I just because I uh, am no longer on the internet, I can no longer edit this code, even though it's really just eventually CSS. Because every single time you have to modify something has to go to some Amazon cloud get processed by the SAS uh, code and then sent back down and injected into your frame, excuse me, into your iframe. And so after a particularly long and annoying trip where I wasn't able to fix anything, I decided I wanted to try and find a solution for this. And eventually I found something. Um, it's a project called Opal. Opal's not something that I wrote. It's an existing project, but it's absolutely amazing. Uh, it's what's called a source to source compiler. And so what that means is that you can take a project like Opal and have, if you have uh, code that's written in Ruby, you can run Opal over it, and then it generates JavaScript. It's really, really cool. You can have a, li a programming uh, language like Ruby and completely bring it onto the web today. Um, and to understand, in case you're unfamiliar with source to source compilers, or if you've never taken like a computer science course, you might not quite understand how this sort of thing works. Um, it, so I just want to give a quick overview. We have uh, three different main processes that go into this. Uh, there's lexing, parsing, and code generation. So um, lexing is the first step that happens whenever you have to deal with an interpolated um, piece of code. So this is the same way that like stuff like Babel or other tools work. And the first step 
is lexing. It's called. It's also uh, called scanning in some circles, and that's kind of a clear understanding of what it does. Basically, if you take your text file and you start doing something with it, like you give it to a, a compiler or an interpreter or something, the very first thing it does is start scanning it character by character to try and understand what your code is doing. So it looks, in this case, we're scanning a really simple JavaScript file, and it's like, oh, hey, that's a variable. And then it goes next, and it's like, oh, that's an identifier, et cetera. And then it just kind of breaks up all of your different code into these different words so that the programming uh, environment can understand what it is you're trying to understand. And each one of those words are called tokens. And each one of those tokens kind of represent a concept that exists within the programming language. Now, the one thing that makes uh, lexing a little bit odd, though, is that even though this is completely valid JavaScript, um, this also lexes just fine. The lexer doesn't give a shit about your validity of your code. All it does is make sure that what you have written is words. It's like you could put a dictionary in a blender. It would still be English or Greek or whatever other language you want to speak um, in when you pour it out, but it's not necessarily makes sense. Uh, where you get actual meaning behind your words is the next step in parsing. Parsing is when we take all those individual tokens and then we assign value and meaning to it and the order in which it's presented. And so in this case, you can tell we have a variable, we called it sum, and then we set it equal to those two numbers being added. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, so that's the parsing step. It's fairly straightforward. The next step is code generation, which is by far the most technically complicated thing, but it's fairly easy to understand at a really high level. Um, now, obviously, I, I showed you what that last code meant in like a prose, a paragraph, and computers don't actually store data in plain English paragraphs, unfortunately. Uh, what they actually do is store it in something more like this. On the left-hand side here, it's more of a tree-like formation. In fact, that's what they're called. They're called abstract, abstract syntax trees, or uh, ASTs. If you've ever had any work with Babel or similar JavaScript transpilation processes, you might have heard that term before. And all an AST is is a sort of um, a representation of the data structure of your code. It's just a way for the computer to understand all the different paths and uh, tracks that your code can possibly go down. And what's awesome about ASTs is that once you have it in a generic form like that, like a, a form that can be unified no matter how, you, how many spaces or if you use tabs or anything else, you're able to modify it on the fly and uh, do stuff like this. So we can take our original JavaScript code and once we get to an AST, we can look at it to figure out that, okay, we're trying to define a variable and set it equal to that and we can convert it to another programming language. And so there you go, and our code is Ruby. And now I want to do something the opposite. Now that I kind of understood what, um, you know, source-to-source uh, -source compilers and transpilation, how it works. I wanted to make SAS work in the browser. So first step was to create a file. I uh, just called it Opal SAS. Let me do a few imports up at the top. This is a Ruby file, so I import uh, the Opal compiler itself to do the transpilation process. Um, Opal parser, so since SAS by itself is useless, you need to be able to give it CSS or SCSS in order to compile it. Um, in, into your eventual CSS, we have to allow for the compiled code to understand the CSS that we're giving it. So we have to include a separate parser as well. Then we include SAS, the library. Uh, this is just the original vanilla, um, same SAS you would use in a Ruby environment. And then uh, finally, just a function, call it SAS builder, where it takes in uh, the string of CSS, your file, or SCSS, sorry. And then an options object, so you can do stuff like change the syntax if you want to use SAS or SCSS, et cetera. And you pass that into the actual function that's used under the covers if you're ever uh, using the SAS compilation project proper, <coughs> excuse me, property. So get that all done, fire up my terminal, and wait a few seconds, and hey, holy shit, it worked, and it didn't blow up. And I was really, really excited and feeling kind of proud of myself because that was a good, a well-spent afternoon. Uh, I created a real quick uh, HTML file just to open it and feeling excited. And I opened up my terminal and crap, it's broken. And see, up until I don't know if I mentioned this, I, I've never written Ruby before. I've written one Ruby file in my life a long time ago when I was working in QA. I have no idea what, uh, un, sorry, undefined method uh, for class SAS util multi byte string scanner means. It certainly wasn't any code that I wrote, as you saw. And so that's what was really frustrating and what led me to understand the first rule of transpiling code, and that's it never works. Well, the first time, like eventually you can get it to work, but the very first time you do stuff, it's almost inevitably going to be broken. Even though most of these programming tools work really well and they do phenomenal things, when you deal with like all the different assumptions that have been made over the decade that SAS has existed and the five or so years that Opal has existed, there's going to be some kind of rough edges you need to sand in order to get those two to fit together. And so <laughs> rather than to get discouraged, I decided to dig in 
and uh, look at the look at the error. I was like, okay, I don't really know what this means, but I'm pretty sure class is like a Ruby thing. Uh, I don't really even understand it in JavaScript still. And so I just decided to copy and paste that into my terminal, search the project for it, and luckily there was only one file that actually was doing that class definition, so I dig into that file. I open it up, and I start looking around, and I find that where it's being used <coughs> in the file, and I start reading the comments, because luckily most Ruby projects are ridiculously well com uh, commented, and it says it is a wrapper of the native string scanner, and I was like, okay, so native sounds like it's a built-in thing, but again, I don't really know Ruby, so I consult the Ruby docs, and turned out, yeah, okay, so string scanner is a built-in thing, and Opal is supposed to compile built-in things, and so it didn't, and it is broken, and that brings me to tool number two, and that's that tools aren't perfect. Um, in this particular case, Ruby, or sorry, SAS was using a Ruby API that Opal didn't think was important enough to compile, and that sucked, because that completely broke my project, and so I decided to try and figure out how the hell they even do it in the first place. Is that a high-level high understanding of what you know Opal did and how it functioned, but I didn't really know how it actually, like the nitty-gritty details worked. Uh, so I looked through the project. I found the string scanner definition, since the thing that was broken seemed to be built on that. I thought, uh, open up the file in Vim yet again, and then I start looking, and I have absolutely no idea how any of this works. I don't know Ruby, and I. Uh, well, it turns out, okay, I started to see some patterns, though. Like, okay, beginning of line, scan, those are all things that I remembered from the docs had been defined as string scanner APIs. So it looks like every single time you want to use a method or an API on a class in Ruby, in Opal, all it is is a new function. So that was easy enough. I just defined it. And then I started looking at, like, what the hell to put in that function other than just that name. And it turns out that there, it's actually pretty straightforward. It's just a bunch of strings. Uh, even though the formatting is a little bit weird, each one of these um, features are, is pure JavaScript that they just wrote. They re-implement every single Ruby API just in JavaScript, and then they have a couple of special variable things like this that are kept in uh, Ruby state and are just put in. It's a lot like ESX templates, if you've ever used that. You can do a lot of really, really powerful things. It turns out it was actually fairly straightforward. So I went back to the docs and tried to figure out how the hell match size even works, and then I submitted a patch, and I got my first Ruby PR change thing into a project, and I was super proud. And so now I have that lo patch locally. I was you know, stoked because I had figured it out. We can buy a project, open it up, and hell yeah, there's no more errors. It all works, and it was great. And then I decided to actually see if it worked rather than just blow up, and of course it didn't. Um, there was immediately an error as soon as I tried to use the project, uh, which brings me to rule three. <laughs> Whenever you're dealing with transpiling languages or anything like that, it, it, it's super tedious. Like, it might seem like a really hard project to bring a Ruby programming language or even just a major Ruby library to the web, and honestly, it's not that hard. It just takes a lot of little tiny wor work. It's a lot of little sanding details. It, and it happens every single time. I've tried to transpile a number of projects, now several dozen uh, open source front end libraries all to the web, and it's never really simple most of the time, but eventually you can get it done. It just takes some time. Uh, luckily, I just had a son, and so I had a lot of free time while he was taking naps in order to try and get some little tiny changes in quickly. Um, but the key thing to keep in mind is just not get, like, uh, depressed at how uh, problematic this is. You just want to try and simplify everything as much as you can. You see, um, in this particular case, <coughs> I can tell you that that error that was generated uh, ended up being a code issue within the SAS library itself. Well, so um, there are certain features within the Ruby programming language that really can't be truthfully polyfilled in JavaScript for a number of language reasons, but um, you can just kind of rewrite the project in a different way in order to get it to work, and it pretty much works the same. And so I, that's what I had to do. I had to change the SAS library itself in order to get it to work. And so if you're keeping track, I've had to change SAS, had to change Opal, and spoiler alert, eventually I'll have to change some gem files and dependencies. Ultimately, several hundred changes across dozens of files, across you know a few handful of locations. It's, it's a lot to mentally manage to understand all these things. And so rather than like edit those files directly and change them by hand, I started to use a, um, I pulled out the Opal tool that I was originally using and started using Opal Webpack. This is just a really thin wrapper around Opal. Um, and all it is really doing is exposing the transpiled files to the Webpack life, uh, life cycle. Webpack's a really popular JavaScript packager if you've never used it. And it let me really just leverage my favorite Webpack loader, which is, <coughs> excuse me, string replace loader. All this is really doing is a whole bunch of regexes. And I do mean a lot of regexes. There's, like I said, several hundred that eventually are done. Um, this GIF ended up blowing up PowerPoint, so I had to cut it short because it was I couldn't scroll as long. But um, it basically just allows me to 
I'm not really using regexes like you would think with other crazy little symbols. It's just a whole bunch of strings. I'm doing a find and replace in the project. So whenever a certain string is found that ends up breaking the project, I replace it with a new string that kind of does the exact same thing, just in a different method that actually works with Enable. And so eventually, several hundred regexes later, it's done, and I have offlinesass.club. Uh, this is a really stupid website. It's, it's really dumb. It's a really ugly website. Um, all it is is two boxes. Um, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Uh, let me zoom out. And yeah, so all it is is you change. Um, this is just a implementation of SAS in the browser. We can make the font better here. Uh, Cornflower blue is a better color. Hit compile, and then holy shit, it works. And that's completely local. That's completely offline. Um, you know, that's not hitting a server or anything. It's it's complete. I have the entirety of the SAS runtime running inside of a web worker offline. It works. It's the entire Ruby implementation. It's great. It, thank you very much. It's really impressive. Please. Um, it's finally I can finally tell my partner that it was worth all that time. Um, so yeah, it, it works, and I was like super pumped. I, I wrote like a, bag, a braggy tweet to talk about it because it was like I said a really long time in order to really get it to work. And you know, I have a lot of really smart friends because I'm lucky enough to work on a browser. And immediately they sent me a whole bunch of bugs, and I was like, shit. <laughs> you know, it's like all these problems, that, and it's like an ugly website to boot. So I have like nothing to be proud of. Um, and it was really frustrating because I had spent all that time, and I felt I'd finally gotten into, to work in exactly the environment that I had been planning to, or trying to. And unfortunately, there was a whole bunch of things that SAS does that I didn't even know it did. Um, <clears throat> and that brings me to rule four, which is to test everything. Um, and I don't know about you guys. Like I said before, I've been a web developer for a pretty long time. And when I grew up, testing really wasn't a thing on the web. I'm definitely better nowadays, but I still kind of struggle to recognize where to test and when to test on all these different sort of you know, things like that. But luckily, when you're doing code translation, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and because it's a Ruby project, you can kind of inherit all of the project, the tests from Ruby, which luckily has a huge testing environment and it's a huge testing culture. And so what happened was I ended up going over to SAS's test file and they ended up having about 3,000 assertions within their code base that was um, every single combination of every single SAS feature doing all these different crazy things, like a really, 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 really complex level and intricate level of testing. And um, I, you know, I was like, holy shit, this is great. I can finally test all the features. And then I realized that this is using a whole bunch of Ruby assertions, which unfortunately can't be tested in the browser. And there's no reason for me to test SAS outside of the browser if I'm trying to do it in JavaScript. And so I ended up having to transpile every single one of these assertions by hand, uh, rewriting the logic in JavaScript. And that ended up being the biggest time sink of the entire project. Like, like I said on rule three, it's, it's super, super tedious. But can tell you that eventually, that's why I'm here, I did get it done. Um, every single one of those dots represents anywhere from one to 300 assertions that happen inside of the project, and it's all generated uh, automatically. It, it works really, really cool, um, and it, all these tests are being run inside of every single browser that supports web workers, with the exception of IE10, for reasons I don't want to talk about. And um, what's even cooler is because uh, I had sort of known that it would be tedious and tried to think about all the different ways that I could improve the process for myself from a, uh, from a tooling perspective. Not only could I do this in the one version, uh, the latest SAS version, but because I had wrote, written all those regexes rather than hand editing all those files, I can actually have this working in 80 versions, which is every single version of SAS. It, it was originally part of Haml, uh, different projects like SAS for HTML, but um, it was extracted out. And um, basically every single version that's ever been shipped as an independent module can now be automatically transpiled into JavaScript that can run in your browser. So no matter what the project is, no matter what version they are, they don't have an excuse to have to have a server. They can run it locally. And that's all completely generated automatically. It's a, and it's, it's a lot. It's a long project. I mean, it was seven years of SAS. Every single version, like I said, that's ever been done is, is available. It's really cool. I was pretty proud of it. Um, and so now I just have this cool little command. I can run grunt generate SAS and wait because it has to go through every single version of SAS and every single test and do thousands of assertions and 20 different browser majors. It's, it's, it, it takes a long time. And eventually, when it's done, um, you know, it, it works. And you can load it in every single browser. I've yet to find a bug after filing a whole lot of other bugs. And I'm really, really stoked about it. It, it, it works today. You can go to offlinesass.club and check it out, because it's fixed now. It no longer has those bugs. But 
<laughs> as happy as I was with the project, there was one particular thing that bugged me. Uh, can anybody guess what it was? Can you tell? Yeah, very good. It's 2.7 M, uh, in that's the human readable side, just in case you're unfamiliar with what that means. It's 2.7 megabytes of fucking JavaScript. That's insane. That's a crazy amount of JavaScript for a really stupid project, right? Like, this isn't even like a, a website. This is one single file that by itself can't really be a website except for this stupid website I made, which is completely useless. And admittedly, that is 2.7 of minified but not compressed. Ultimately, if used broadly, which is like a, a more aggressive gzip, you can do cooler stuff with it in the browser today. Uh, it's down to 250 kilobytes, but that's still an obscene level of JavaScript. There's no reason for a website to rely on that sort of a thing, and it's kind of a crappy as a web developer to have to ship that much stuff to the, to the web in order just to have a feature. And unfortunately, though, there's not a whole lot that you or I as, uh, excuse me, <coughs> as web developers can do to make that better. When you're dealing with transpilation, like we're trying to bring an entire Ruby runtime and an entire huge, even by Ruby standards, library to the web. It's going to take a lot of bytes in order to get it to work. Um, and there's not a lot we can do one way or the other to make that better for now. But luckily, there is a fair amount of smart people in the JavaScript community that are trying to make it better. It's a project called WebAssembly. Now, WebAssembly is really, really, really cool. Um, but it's to understand why WebAssembly is cool, we kind of have to dive in Inception style to a few layers. Um, to get, so to understand WASM, WebAssembly, you have to understand ASM, or Assembly. Uh, JS. Um, and to really understand that, you have to go, again, sorry, it's going to be a few layers. Um, this is, you have to go talk about this guy. Uh, this is Alon. He works at Mozilla. Uh, he's one of the wonderful researchers they employ. And he, in a former life, was a game developer, a uh, game engine developer, actually. He had a blog where he talked about all these different projects he was working on, <coughs> including a really, really cool project he was a part of uh, called Bullet. Um, which is a physics engine. I don't know if anybody here is a game developer, but this is like a rendering that exists. They actually have won Oscars with this project um, because it's used in like X-Men and other huge Marvel movies just because of the amazing realistic... I mean, it looks like a video, right? It doesn't look like a render, but it's, it's really impressive. And, um, you know, that blog post that I showed a moment ago was back in 2010. And I don't know how, much of you, how many of you remember, but there used to be a thing called Flash on the web. And it was a fairly popular thing, but Alon, being a game developer, was told that Flash was no longer going to be available because of a thing called the iPhone. And it was a really difficult thing for a lot of game developers. Like, crap, what are we going to do? Because the, the web sucks for gaming, at least back in 2010. And so <coughs> he was like, I want to bring this type of performance to the web, and I don't want to have to completely rewrite my Oscar-winning uh, project in order to do it, right? And so he decided to create a project originally just to bring Bullet, uh, called mscripten. So what mscripten is, one more layer deep, and I promise this is the bottom of it, uh, is a part of, or is an extension to LLVM. And that is their actual logo. It's pretty badass, but kind of ridiculous. Uh, what LLVM is, is a low-level virtual machine. And it's kind of, basically, it's a collection of tools that are used to compile, usually C or other native programs. If you've ever had to compile an application from source and used Clang or anything like that, it's a part of LLVM. Um, all it does is take uh, code, usually like C or Rust or other programming languages, and then compile it into bytecode so it can run locally. And what was really cool about LLVM when it was originally designed a number of years ago is that it, it introduced this concept of front-end and back-end to that architecture. See, historically, when you had stuff like CC or GCC or the old uh, C compilers, you would just you know, have your C program, run a thing over it, you get bytecode out. What LLVM introduced was the ability to have a different uh, application or a different piece of code interpret the beginning of it, gener generate a, um, inter sorry, interpret the code that you give it initially, so your C code, your Rust code, all those different things have different front ends. That way, when new programming languages are, in, uh, are created, you can use the same infrastructure, the same optimization engine, you can just have to write a little bit of new things that kind of translate, it, translate that new programming language to LLVM bytecode. Then the back end takes that bytecode that's being generated in uniformly across all the different programming languages and then it outputs it to various architectures. Uh, originally, the, in, the intent was that you could output to you know, a PowerPC, the old Mac processors, or uh, x86, or ARM, or all these different architectures. And um, it was really cool. Uh, and so 
well, what's cool about mscripting is it kind of leverages those things and acts as a backend output to JavaScript. And so just like Opal takes your Ruby and outputs JavaScript, LLVM goes over to your like C++ code usually, converts it into bytecode, and then mscripting comes in as a backend, comes over and outputs that to JavaScript. So it takes C code, converts it to JavaScript, and <laughs> that JavaScript that it outputs right there, that is what ASM is. So we can finally start going back up in the inception tunnel. And um, so what's cool about ASM, because really it's just JavaScript that's being outputted from a transpiler, just like Opal is JavaScript being output from a transpiler, is that ASM is actually standardized. Uh, what that means is that it can have a specific and similar output that runs uniformly across all browsers. And what's particularly interesting about that is that it allows you for some kind of ridiculous levels of optimizations. See, historically, JavaScript was originally written by people and for people to read, right? With the exception of concatenation or you know, Google and Facebook code, it's meant for people to read. Um, and unfortunately, though, ASM isn't. Like, this is what ASM code looks like most of the time. And um, yeah, you're not supposed to read this, and you're not supposed to write this. Please, God, never write code like this. But what's cool is that because it's written by a machine, they can optimize it for ways in which the JavaScript compilers that exist in all the different browsers love to have their code. For, a, for an example of something of, of what I mean, see, you'll notice a pattern of this where you have a pipe zero, so bitwise operator, I believe. Um, and what that does is it forces everything to the left-hand side of the pipe to be a 32-bit integer. So to understand why that's important, understand why this is such a cool trick. Uh, imagine this code for a second. If I were to tell you what is the result of x plus 2, you, you can't answer that, right? You have to know is x a string, in which case you have to you know, string it and then concatenate it with a number, and then is it an object, in which case you have to call to string on it and, concat and then add it with concatenation again, or is it an integer and then you do actual arithmetic on it. It, you, like, it takes mental overhead to understand how to do algebra compared to just you know, basic math, right? Basic arithmetic. But a compiler is no different than you are. It has to do all these different assumptions and changes and tracking in order to understand how to run this code. But if you were to change it to something like this, please don't, though, by the way, but for the compiler's point of view, if you can say that, okay, so if x is x or bit y is zero, that means that it's absolutely always going to be an integer. There's no longer a question. You can it is able to immediately assume that it's going to do basic arithmetic. That allows it to... Uh, use much fewer processor instructions and therefore execute less code on your processor, be more memory efficient, be more battery efficient, be more uh, just faster. You're like The code is able to execute faster because it's generating code that processors love to have. It's easily optimizable at a low, low level. And because it's easily optimizable at a really low level, pardon me, you can start doing some absolutely batshit stuff on the web. I do mean really, really crazy stuff. So this is a project called SQL JS. It is actually web, uh, sorry, SQL Lite thrown in mscripting and then output. So it has the entire JavaScript representation of SQL Lite. You can run in your browser and it works. There's shipping websites that, that rely on this because they want to have a local SQL database. Of course, we have other databases in the browser, but that's it's not really the point. The, the, the idea is that you can start to bring these really, really huge, impressive code that you would never even have considered to be possible on the web previously and have it work really performantly on the web. And I do mean performant. There's actually a project Quake.js. It's a port of the Quake 3 engine. It runs in the browser completely locally on your device. If anybody wants to have a deathmatch later, holla. But it is a really, really amazing. You get 60 frames a second on basically all modern uh, browsers. And it's fun. Not only that, you can do even more ridiculous stuff because, you know, Doom's ported to everything from like a you know, computer to an Apple Watch. You can bring operating systems um, to the browser. Like, seriously, it, it's really, here, let me, this is uh, actually running in the browser. Oop, sorry, let me zoom out a little bit so you can see it, because I can't see it. There we go. And, it, I mean, like, it's an actual Windows 95, mute, uh, represent, like, it's the actual thing. You can open up, like, Solitaire, and I'm not going to waste your time because I'm really bad at solitaire. Oh, wait, I got one thing. There we go. It's the best I've ever done. But it's the full rep. This is actually Windows 95. This isn't an emulated, like, weird CSS skin. This is the full operating system. You can do crazy things. In fact, there's another project called, like, JS Mess, which is powering a whole bunch of video games being brought to archive.org today. All these abandoned old uh, Atari games or other, you know, Apple II games. You can play them online today, uh, thanks to, like, Jeremy Scott and the JS Mess Foundation. It's really, really cool. Um, and, you know, all, all that stuff is really possible because of 
ASM. Like it, it's this new way to we can bring all these different existing libraries to our code. And most of the time, when you think about old libraries that are still useful, most of the time they'll be probably C libraries and other kind of logic or algorithms that's existed in pretty much every other programming language for a really, really long time, but we've never really had access to on the web. We'd have to re-implement those things over and over again. And while the web loves to re-implement things, it's not always the best idea, especially when you don't, you know, aren't experts in those algorithms. But beside the point, you might be saying, okay, well, that's ASM, so why should I care about WebAssembly? That's a fair question, because I've done a poor job explaining it, but I had to explain what ASM was in order to understand why WASM is particularly interesting. So again, <coughs> like I said before, ASM is just JavaScript, right? It's, it, even though it's ridiculously weird and compact JavaScript, it's still just JavaScript. It's a text file, it's .js, it gets sent down to the browser. And after, once it gets sent down to the browser, like every other interpreted language, it has to be lexed, it has to be parsed. The, uh, the compiler has to take that parse tree, that AST, and then generate the bytecode in order to run it inside of the browser during the code gen phase. And all that stuff takes time. For, for my SAS project that, uh, that I showed you before, on lower end devices, it can take up to like 15 to 20 seconds just to boot the JavaScript file. That's to read it locally from a ca like a cached file and then just scan through every single character. And because it's 2.5 megabytes, it's a, it's a huge file, right? Or 2.7. And that's a, it's a, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. And what's frustrating is that code being generated at the bottom because ASM is a standardized format is repetitive. Every single time you have to download an ASM file, it's generating identical bytecode. There's no state involved or anything like that. And so it's, they were starting to think at the TC39, one of the organizations that uh, kind of controls the way that JavaScript moves forward, started thinking, well, what if we just skip all that? You know, what, and so what WebAssembly is, is uh, rather than going through lexing, parsing, and code generation every single time, it is just the binary representation that would normally be output from the code generation stage. And so that means that you're able to ship a binary file that was originally JavaScript, or it was kind of a JavaScript-like file in the interim step, and then output in something that can basically be running. So if you have an ASM file and you have a WebAssembly file, by the time that the ASM file is still being lexed, your WebAssembly file is already executing. So it can have huge performance impl implications, especially for really large, you know, huge files, which you know might sound kind of like technically neat, but kind of boring. You might be wondering, like, how this will never affect me. I'm not going to waste my time building, you know, offline SAS.club or whatever. And that's that's fair. It's a stupid project, but it's still kind of fun. And I would encourage all of you to try it. But even if you never want to look into this or anything like that, that doesn't mean you're not going to be affected by this. I mean, take for example React. Um, React has nothing to do with WebAssembly, at least currently, but it's completely changed the way that most people write front-end code these days, right? I mean, like Angular 2's completely uh, changed could be closer, more closely aligned. Ember's Glimmer project, you know, kind of copied a lot of the logic, and a lot of that's really powered by that underlying concept of a virtual DOM, where you have a representation of your state in memory and then the actual DOM, and then whenever you change something in memory, it gets converted over and <coughs> into your actual DOM, and it's applied. That, that, that core concept is something that's pretty much one in a lot of the NBC you know, games these days. And pretty much if you're writing any kind of complex JavaScript application, you're using a virtual DOM-like structure most of the time these days. Uh, so imagine there's a project called Virtual DOM, which is just an abstract representation of that concept without all the React ceremony around it. Um, you could, there's no reason why this has to be written in JavaScript. This core is just a bunch of algorithms and that can almost completely be implemented in any programming language. It doesn't have to have access directly to the DOM that can be communicated elsewhere. And so you could have a project like Virtual DOM that's being implemented outside of JavaScript and then brought to the web using WebAssembly, which means that your applications, if using it, could boot faster, it could execute larger uh, comparison trees much faster, it could just generally be more efficient and better for your users. And even if you don't write this code, it is highly possible that the extremely competitive JavaScript library world will get there and get there soon. I mean, they're doing already really, really meaningful and impressive things on the web. Take, for example, another project, um, ogv.js. Uh, this is a project that actually brought the Og Vorbis and WebM video codecs to non-supported browsers. They, they have a WebAssembly outputted version right now, but it's still running a WebAssembly in non-compliant browsers. And you can run videos in these codecs for um, you know browsers that don't support them. And this isn't just a small project. Wikipedia actually runs this on their all of their websites right now. They pretty much require that any video being uploaded to their site run be encoded in Ogvorbis or WebM as a fallback. 
And there's browsers out there, including our own, my, uh, Edge, that don't support those formats. And so they load a JavaScript engine to run that video code. It downloads the code, parses it, plays it in the canvas and audio tags. And it runs really, really well. Users don't notice these things. They see these, <coughs> they just see a video being played. And so this isn't like a cool hack that's kind of dumb but still works. It's actually really making things better. WebM is, excuse me, WebM is a smaller video file and it saves users real bandwidth. This is a real project that can actually have implication and already does. Or, you know, even more um, probably something that might impact even more of you. Has anybody here ever heard of Facebook? Ever used it? Okay, cool. Yeah, it's, 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 it's California. I don't know if it came out here. But um, what's cool is that Facebook actually does this thing. If you ever upload a photo, which is a, another popular thing, they end up loading a file that looks kind of like this inside of a web worker that just gets triggered automatically. They're extremely efficient with their code, so they only load code you know, when they need to use it. If you, I actually wanted to see what type of JavaScript they were loading. So I started digging in. Notice something kind of interesting. Um, inside of their code, they have a thing called provides module uh, ljpeg. And looking into it, you might notice a similar pattern in some of their code that I showed you with some of their ASM stuff. And uh, in case you're unfamiliar, ljpeg is a C implementation for a JPEG decoder. See, Facebook is actually loading uh, mscripted JPEG decoder inside of a web worker whenever you try to upload a photo. Because some people like to upload raw photos or you know, like 50K wide photos, and they're doing, uh, rather than uploading all that stuff on a potentially low and slow bandwidth, they actually completely resize it locally, then only upload the smaller bits. Something that Facebook is doing today and has been doing for actually a number of years at this point. It's a really meaningful thing to be able to bring all these different projects to the web. And it means, you know, it can actually have really, really big impacting changes. So all this stuff kind of brings me to my fifth and final point um, when dealing with transpiled code or wanting to do something. Let's just do something dumb. Like all this project is possible because you know, Alon a number of years ago wanted to bring a ridiculously crazy, useful uh, you know, gaming engine to the web. And a whole bunch of people told him he was stupid and he made an amazing thing. And now a whole bunch of people tell all these, every single step of the way there's been a lot of naysayers, but you can really, you know, just ignore them. Just build something dumb and you can actually have some real world impact and really change the way that people do stuff. So thanks, my name's Patrick. <laughs> Anybody have any questions about anything? Yeah, please. Do you have a microphone down here? Possible. If you want to shout it while they bring you down, I can repeat it. So um, that is a potential. So sorry, hold on. I've tripped like five times, so I just want to fix my shoe. The question was. Um, Am I going to be reworking this stuff with Opal and have it be uh, work in WebAssembly? That ultimately would definitely be a goal. Um, the problem is that Opal currently is not outputting assembly. It's uh, outputting JavaScript that folks like myself have wrote to map it. So in order for us to support it, we would have to um, get it to basically compile with an LLVM. As of right now, LLVM is the main tool that outputs WebAssembly. It, since it's a binary format, you have to get over to an LLVM bytecode intermediate format, intermediary format. And so it's absolutely possible. It would just take a complete rewrite of the project. Um, and, and theoretically, uh, if anybody wants to do, just to be clear, Ruby and C are not like the only languages that can do this. There's uh, WebAssembly already uh, works with C and the fantastic Rust language that Mozilla is working on for their new uh, engine servo. And there's um, dozens, and if you name a programming language, there's multiple like, pretty old projects, old in a good way, uh, that can compile it over to JavaScript. Uh, any other questions? Cool. If anybody has one afterwards, feel free to reach out. Like I said, my name is Patrick.